Hello everyone, this is Mohammed Alian, and today I'm going to talk about our paper titled Data Direct IO Characterization for Future IO System Exploration. This is a joint work um, uh, between University of Illinois folks, KAIST, and Intel Lab researchers. Before I start the presentation, let me explain the context of this paper first. In this work, we have studied the interactions between IO devices, processor, and memory in modern servers. This paper can be divided into two parts. The first part serves as a tutorial for Intel Data Direct IO technology and how it affects the system performance. In the second part, we discuss the inaccuracies in Gen5's IO modeling and implement a model that accurately simulates uh, a server with DDIO technology enabled. All right, the first question that we are going to address here is um, to discuss how um, traditional IO devices communicate with CPU and memory. Let's discuss an example here, network packet reception from a network interface card, or in short, NIC, in a traditional server. The NIC is connected over a PCI Express interconnect to the CPU chip and memory. Note that uh, in the following slides, we only show the data movement in the system and remove the detailed interactions uh, between hardware and software components in the system when a network packet is received uh, or transmitted. Assume that the packet is received at the NIC. In the first step, the data is DMA uh, to the network buffers inside the main memory over the PCI Express interconnect and uh, memory channels. Then the CPU is going to fetch data from the memory to either uh, process uh, the packets in the network software stack or uh, process data, the payload in a network application. And uh, then the data is read uh, uh, by a core from the LLC to the private caches to, to uh, uh, be processed. Uh, um, as you can see, for each data unit that is received from the network, uh, this system consumes twice as much bandwidth uh, on the memory channel. Because uh, once the data is written to the memory by DMA transactions, and then the data is read from the memory uh, to be processed in the CPU. Now let's discuss packet transmission. Let's assume that network data, uh, network TX buffers are already, already allocated in the main memory, as you can see in the cartoon this slide. The first data movement happens when the core tries to update a network buffer content. To update the cache lines that belong to uh, the network buffer, first they has to be fetched from the main memory and then get updated in the core's private caches. Next, uh, when DMA uh, reads arrive in the processor chip, the DMA requests cause CPUs, private, and shared caches to be invalidated and written back to the memory after the data is sent to the network device. The reason for invalidating CPU side caches was that traditionally, the I.O. devices were slow and the size of on-chip caches was limited. So it was... Um, very unlikely that a uh, TX buffer gets updated, uh, gets reused uh, again before um, it was replaced due to conflict misses. Therefore, proactive invalidations, as uh, we saw in this example, uh, for TX buffers was an optimization for LLC utilization uh, in traditional systems with uh, slow I.O. devices. Okay, now let's see how the interaction between CPU, memory, and I.O. devices looks like um, uh, in a modern, uh, modern server. First, I'm going to discuss the data movement when a network packet is received from network 
uh, in a system with Intel DDIO technology enabled. After the data is received from the wire, uh, NIC DMAs data to the CPU. Unlike a traditional system in a DDIO enabled processor, the DMA writes land inside the LRC. Once uh, a DMA write is received at the CPU chip, depending on the status of uh, the LLC, we have two scenarios. First scenario is that if the addresses that belong um, to the DMA writes are already cached in the LLC, then LLC with, uh, will be updated uh, with, the day, with the DMA write data. Otherwise, if the data misses in the LLC, DDIO technology will allocate cache lines in LLC and write DMA data to the LLC instead of sending it to uh, DRAM. With that, later the core can fetch data from the LLC instead of DRAM. DDIO can potentially, as you can, as you saw in this slide, can potentially eliminate um, all the uh, memory bandwidth utilization for data reception from an audio device. From the transmission path uh, point of view, the main difference between a DDIO enabled system and a traditional system without DDIO is that DMA reads does not invalidate LRC. Because of that, at the time of packet transmission, it is likely that uh, network buffers are already in the LLC. Therefore, when the core um, wants to update the content of uh, these buffers, it can fetch them uh, to its private caches from LLC instead of DRAM. Once the buffers uh, get uh, updated and DMA reads uh, arrive to the CPU from the NIC. Like a DDIO disabled uh, system, the private caches will be invalidated, but the data stays inside LRC while the DMA transactions read the data into NIC, uh, into the NIC side uh, buffers. Again, as you notice, the main difference between a DDIO enabled and disabled system in the transmission path is that network buffers stay inside the LLC for future references. In the following slides, we are going to go through some experimental results that we collected from real hardware to understand the effectiveness of DDIO. As you can see in the slide, uh, for our experiments on real hardware, we use servers equipped with uh, dual socket Intel Xeon Platinum uh, processors uh, that each socket has uh, three DDR4 memory channels. For network experiments, so we connect two of these servers uh, using 40 GB Ethernet NICs and for SSD, experiments we use Intel Optane SSDs. We run DPDK example applications for networking tests and run FIO, YCSP and Redis for SSD related experiments. This graph shows SSD read bandwidths with DDIO enabled and disabled. Our experiments shows that disabling DDIO actually does not affect SSD's read bandwidths, uh, which is not surprising since the memory bandwidth is much higher than SSD bandwidth. So uh, reading from memory or writing uh, to it is not the bandwidth bottleneck in accessing a, a block device. However, if you look at uh, the memory bandwidth utilization for uh, the same experiment, enabling DDIO significantly reduces memory read and write bandwidth utilization when an application read pages from a block device such as SSD here in this case. So although disabling DDIO doesn't affect the read bandwidth of a standalone SSD microbenchmark, it has a side effect which is 
uh, causing interference inside the memory subsystem. Now let's look at the results uh, when writing to SSD. Again, in terms of write bandwidth, there is no difference between enabled or disabled DDIO modes uh, because as we discussed before, the memory bandwidth is not the bottleneck in the storage stack uh, of our server. However, surprisingly, we see uh, also no difference in terms of memory bandwidth utilization when writing to the SSD with DDIO enabled or disabled. After digging into this, uh, we found out that Xeon processors newer than Sandy Bridge does not evict uh, the IO buffers after DMA reads, uh, regardless of the uh, DDIO configuration. Now let's look at network performance with and without DDIO. As shown, disabling DDIO does not degrade the network uh, reception or transmission bandwidth because uh, the available DDR4 bandwidth is much greater than 40 GB line rate here. Um, same takeaway from uh, our, our previous slides that we talked about SSD. Um, and as expected, we see significant drop in memory bandwidth utilization when enabling DDIO. One interesting result from the memory read bandwidth graph, which is the graph uh, on the left, is that even when DDIO is disabled, the memory bandwidth utilization is lower than the network bandwidth and actually decreases with larger packet sizes. The reason is that uh, the DPDK application that we run only processes the headers of uh, the received packets and the core does not touch the payload. Therefore, as we send lesser packets when the packet size uh, increases, the memory bandwidth read utilization also decreases proportionally. Like SSD writes, as you see in the slide, DDIO does not impact memory uh, bandwidth utilization when transmitting packets over the network in new generation of uh, Xeon processors. To study the effectiveness of DDIO in reducing memory interference between core running IO intensive applications, we run Redis and uh, FIO together and compare Redis uh, performance with isolated runoff uh, Redis. As you can see, <clears throat> Redis performance decreases by up to 7.4% uh, across different uh, workloads. To find the culprit for this performance degradation, uh, we should look at the memory bandwidth utilization graphs in each of these configurations. As you can see in the slide, when DDIO is disabled, uh, memory bandwidth utilization is more than twice as much as when DDIO is enabled. This excessive memory bandwidth utilization of FIO when DDIO is uh, disabled uh, is a reason for performance degradation um, in the core running scenario. Now that we saw the benefits of DDIO, let's discuss the DDIO model that we implemented in Gem5. A few words about Gem5. Gem5 is a state-of-the-art uh, architecture simulator, as probably you know already. Um, Jason Power recently put together a very nice paper about all the features implemented in Gem5 since when the original Gem5 paper was published nine years ago. I recommend taking a look at this paper if you want to know more about the current state of Gem5. Gem5 has a uh, comprehensive model library for CPUs, memories, IO devices, and can simulate a full computer system running a full-fledged Linux. Uh, or Android. Uh, Gem5 can be used for uh, rapid early prototyping and also gaining insights uh, into the uh, system. 
We identified uh, the gem five. That gem five does not model DTIO, which can render the simulation results that involve IO access is inaccurate. Uh, in the remaining of this presentation, I'll discuss how we enable DDIO in GEM5 and show you some experimental results that we collected from our enhanced GEM5. Before I discuss our uh, DDIO modeling in GEM5, let me explain the interactions between memory, CPU, and IO devices in baseline GEM5 um, classic memory system. There are three main components involved here. Um, uh, first component is IO bus, which is a non-coherent crossbar that connects IO devices to the CPU chip. Second, we have um, MEMBUS, which models um, the unchipped network connection um, uh, between LRC banks and memory and IO devices. And third, we have a small cache called IO cache, which uh, at a high level plays the role of an integrated IO controller in real CPU chips uh, for maintaining cache coherency for TMA requests that come from uh, IO devices. Now let's study the uh, data movement between IO devices, memory, and CPU in baseline Gem5 classic memory. Model. When sending data to I.O. devices, the classic memory model of Gen5 models a DDIO enabled system by default. Let's assume that uh, the core has written some data into the memory system that is, uh, and uh, that data is ready for transmission. When the device uh, starts a DMA transaction, um, to read uh, this data from the CPU, it is very likely that the read requests from the device uh, are missed in the IO cache since it's, it's a very small structure. In this case, Gem5 will send snoop requests um, to upper level caches to find the responder cache. The responder cache will then supply the data uh, and downgrade itself to S or um, state. In a case that the TX buffer is inside DRAM, the data is going to be supplied by DRAM as you can see in the cartoon. In this slide, we study the um, uh, data reception path um, from an IO device in, uh, uh, in baseline Gen5. Uh, if DMA write request uh, is a whole cache line, right? Then IO cache invalidates um, the cache line copies in the uh, CPU uh, and write allocate uh, or upgrade the existing cache lines inside the IO cache. The final coherence state that uh, the cache line in the IO cache would be is modified state. Otherwise, if the DMA write is a partial cache line write request, then we can have two scenarios. First scenario is that the write request misses in the IO cache. In this case, Gem5 reads um, an exclusive copy of the cache line by snooping the cache hierarchy and read the cache line either from a cache or DRAM and update uh, the cache line in the uh, IO cache with the partial write. Second scenario is uh, that the IO cache already has the cache line corresponding to the DMA write request. Uh, if that's the case, then uh, Gem5 simply updates uh, the address with the partial write data and upgrade the IO cache state to M state. With that, let's examine uh, the overall Gem5 IO model in terms of its uh, match with uh, DDIO enabled or disabled system. Based on the previous slides, uh, we identified that the current Gem5 model is a mixture of DDIO enabled and disabled system that can uh, lead the computer architects to capture inaccurate results or 
gaining uh, false insights. In the slide, uh, I highlight the characteristics that belong to a disabled DDIO system with red and uh, ones that belong to DDIO enabled system with blue. We can size uh, the IO cache uh, to be very small to model an optimized DDIO disabled system similar to the Xeon processor near processors newer than Sandy Bridge uh, as we discussed earlier in the slide. But Gen5 is still short in modeling a traditional DDIO disabled system and a modern DDIO enabled system. Now let's quickly illustrate how we model DDIO in Gen5. Our goal is to enable DDIO with the least changes in the coherency protocol of the Gen5 memory system. Toward that goal, we restructure uh, the way that IO devices are connected to the rest of the memory system when DDIO is enabled. The cartoon in the left shows the structure of Gen5 components when configuring Gen5 for DDIO disabled system and the right cartoon shows uh, that of uh, for a uh, DDIO enabled system. For modeling a traditional DDIO disabled system, we change the, the IO cache to be an exclusive cache. That means when a cache line is supplied to IO cache by one of the CPU side caches, the cache line in the CPU side caches will be invalidated. For modeling a DDIO enabled system, as you can see in the picture in the right, at a high level, we treat uh, uh, an IO device similar to core. Um, this means that IO cache spills into the LLC instead of memory. We also enhance the IO cache and LLC controllers to efficiently tag IO data and implement a non-intrusive uh, DDIO implementation in the current Gen5 currency protocol. Um, implementation details can be found in the paper. All right, now let's look at the um, results that we collected from our enhanced uh, simulation simulation infrastructure. For our ex Gen5 experiments, um, we developed a NIC driver for Gem5 bare metal that mimics a user space network uh, software stack such as DPDK. The cartoon in the uh, slide shows Gem5 hardware configuration. We simulate uh, a client server uh, system and run two um, uh, server and client threads on each simulated machine. We pin the threads uh, to different uh, physical course since uh, the network application is the only application running on the simulated systems we uh, choose to simulate only dual core ultra for the processor the client threads uh, uh, can be configured to send uh, or receive mtu size uh, packets to and from uh, the server over a 40 gb link we compare uh, three different IO configuration in this uh, kind of in the following slides. Uh, uh, first configuration is disabled optimize, uh, which is basically when the DDIO is disabled, um, but DMA reads do not invalidate the caches. Um, second is DDI disabled, uh, which is the old fashioned IO. Uh, configuration that DMA writes directly goes to the memory and DMA reads invalidate the cache lines. Last configuration is, is the DIO enabled uh, configuration. This graph simply shows the achieved uh, network bandwidth in our setup. As you can see with uh, two client threads, uh, we can saturate the 40 GB link between the client and server. Now let's see how memory bandwidth utilization looks like uh, when the simulated server uh, receives uh, packets with uh, various LLC size. Uh, as expected, uh, since the network uh, application only touches headers, um, we see much lower memory read utilization than writes. DDI is pretty effective in reducing the memory bandwidth utilization when LLC is larger than 32 megabytes. The reason 
is that since two full descriptor buffers um, occupy more than three uh, three megabytes uh, of LRC, and the default DDI only uses ten percent of the LRC size, LRC sizes smaller than thirty two megabytes are not sufficient to keep all the network data inside the LRC. Therefore, we have a lot of conflict misses in the LRC and therefore high memory write band disutilization. The graph in the slide shows uh, memory read and write band utilization when the server transmit packets. Uh, since we don't have any data reuse in our network software stack, uh, then uh, I mean, in the transmission path, path of our network software stack, then DDIO enabled and disabled uh, systems basically show the same memory read um, bandwidth utilization. Note that since um, DDIO does not uh, limit the LLC usage in the transmission path, um, as soon as LLC sizes uh, surpass uh, 3 megabyte, uh, we start seeing dramatic drops in memory write bandwidth utilization. To summarize, in this paper we explained uh, the Intel DDIO technology in detail um, and illustrated how DDIO can reduce interference in the memory subsystem by showing experimental results from real system and our uh, uh, enhanced simulation uh, models in Gen5. Our DDIO uh, implementation for Gen5 can be accessed using the following link. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you so much for your attention and see you soon in the ISPAS uh, virtual conference.